I'm Tom Bryan, I'm director of the Institute of Optics. Good to have some people con connected online as well. Uh, welcome back. I hope everybody had a, a restful Thanksgiving break. Um, it is a pleasure. It's always a special pleasure when we're uh, hearing news from across campus, in this case, from our own laboratory for laser energetics. Uh, John Zugel, uh, serves as a distinguished scientist and the Laser and Material Technology Division Director over at the Laser Lab, as well as a professor of optics here at the Institute. Um, he's got a number of uh, very distinguished accomplishments on his record, many of them over within the Laser Lab, but uh, going outside the doors of the Laser Lab uh, in sort of the outreach and education category. He was one of the main organizers of the Sigmund School uh, when it was here in Rochester a few years ago. He's been a champion of laser, especially high power laser technology. Um, uh, he is a graduate of the Institute of Optics, and so we're very proud to have him as an alumnus. And the, the most recent big announcement, well, not that the big, big announcement, of course, was uh, the National Ignition Facility um, and the announcements associated with break-even that the laser lab had a big part in. Uh, but most recently, the, the laser bat lab has been approved for a pretty major expansion, and that's what we're going to hear about today. And I didn't want to let this pass, though. I work very closely with John an NSF regional innovation engine, so we've got to know each other reasonably well. And you know, I, I was so pleased that John not only was able to be here, but provide a title that was the longest title we've had, at least in a couple of years. And so I thought, whenever you see that many words put together, it's just right to go to chat GPT and ask chat GPT what it can do with those letters. And so I asked ChatGPT if it could take this title and turn it into a limerick. And it actually did an okay job. If you rearrange these letters, you, if you're ChatGPT, come up with, in labs where bright minds do convene, E.P. Oko is the laser machine. With petawatts great might, laser dances with light in ultra high intensity scenes. Oh, wow. So there you go. I'll need a copy of that at some point. Thank yes. you. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Tom. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to be here to present. Um, I hope you all had a great uh, holiday and some time off. It looks a little thinner than usual. Some people are probably still dragging back from, from uh, their turkey path or their vacation or their trips. Um, it's, it's great to be here because, as Tom said, I was a student many years ago before the building existed. Uh, it's been a few decades. But it's it's nice to see connected to my home department. Um, and at, at LLE since 1996, when I finished my PhD here, and I'm here to talk about the latest, um, I'll say, biggest thing at the at the moment uh, that I'm working on with a bunch of colleagues um, at LLE, many of whom actually were also um, Institute of Optics um, students and, and alums. Now, uh, my my title graphic just splashes on the screen. To the two big um, items that I'll be talking about, the uh, multi-petawatt physics prioritization workshop that I led uh, a year and a half ago in Paris, and it was an international, well, you can read it, international focus on frontier science enabled by a new generation of ultra-intense and powerful lasers. And that has led, I'll say directly to a proposal that was um, awarded to us to design and prototype what will be when we get to build it, if we get to build it, but I think if we're on track, um, a uh, amazing facility that would have two 25 petawatt laser systems to do some interesting science. So let's get going on this. I said, I'm going. There we go. All right. So I tend to breadcrumb things here. Uh, EP Opal, which is uh, Omega EP is one of our um, current big laser systems. Opal is an optical parametric amplifier line that um, we will design and hopefully we'll get a chance to build in a few years. Um, we got this design proposal, and multi-petawatt lasers now represent the scientific frontier, at least on the on the big scale. You know, science uh, uh, scales across energies and time scales, and um, you know, uh, 
spatial extents. But uh, multi petawatts certainly at one corner of that box at this point. And this multi petawatt physics prioritization, I will from now on call it the MP3 workshop. Um, identified three science themes and related science questions, plus some needed multi petawatt capabilities. OPCPA, this optical parametric uh, chirp pulse amplification, which is kind of the, I'd say, the, the next stage of what Donna Strickland and Gerard Maru. Um, in, you know, invented when they were out at LLE, but they were both Institute of Optics um, members of the community, um, enables kilojoule class ultra broadband amplification. So, you know, many people think of femtoseconds, that's usually relatively small energies. We're getting up to kilojoules, which is, which is uh, a big deal. You can put a lot of energy into a small volume in a short amount of time, which creates very intense um, Focal spots. Um, we've been working on this actually since 2008 when we finished Omega EP. <clears throat> the MTW or multi terawatt laser facility um, has been um, expanded over time, and I'll, I'll point that out. It's de demonstrated technology that's scalable to the levels that we uh, intend to implement on EP Opal. Um, and it's also uh, MTW Opal will be the prototype front end for this future system and be used as a subscale experimental user facility. It's available now, and I encourage students who are interested in um, using these kind of fields to reach out. I mean, I, I was uh, thinking that this is a little bit of what's, what's happening in optics talk, and this is actually what's happening in lasers in Rochester talk. Um, so come on over, um, and we've got lots of interesting things to do with, with students and faculty. Um, and then last but not least, co-locating this new facility with Omega EP beamlines will address the needs of the global research community with flexible configuration. That's a big deal for us at LA. We don't generally build single purpose machines. We try to build something that can be used for a number of different fields um, uh, of science. <clears throat> um, all right, so there we go. For those of you who have not been out to LLE as part of the U of R community, oops, I jumped. Um, come on out, visit us. Um, we're uh, on South Campus, we are part of the university. We're not a, a scary place. Um, we, I mentioned earlier, we have two big laser systems at the moment, the Omega laser system, which is our fusion research and other, um, it supports other research as well, but primarily um, for fusion research. And I like to call it, the, it's a spherical hammer. The, the idea is to have 60 laser beams coming to target chamber center to irradiate spherical targets, which are then compressed um, um, do direct drive, what we call direct drive laser fusion. Tom mentioned the National Ignition Facility that's out at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. They use a different approach called indirect drive where the lasers create x-rays and then drive the target. Omega EP was brought online in 2008. I mentioned that earlier. It implements four NIF-like beams, um, um, each of which can do on the order of five kilojoules per beam in the UV. Uh, for long pulses, nanosecond pulses. And those are used for a bunch of different um, research topics um, that I'll, I'll, I'll touch on. Plus it has two short pulse, uh, picosecond, sub-picosecond, and uh, you know, into the picosecond regime. Um, that's what would be coupled with this optical parametric amplifier line that we uh, will be designing. All right, so I mentioned earlier, high peak power laser research development and applications have expanded rapidly in the last decade or so, with many new petawatt class that's generally accepted to be within you know striking range of a petawatt. So some of these are 100 terawatts, hundreds of terawatts into the into the petawatt regime. And you can see from 2009 to 2019, in 10 years, there was actually kind of an explosion mm -hmm. everywhere but the U.S. Um, this, this is where petawatt laser technology was was developed and first implemented at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. You know, Gerard always wanted to do a petawatt um, when he was here. Uh, he moved off to um, uh, Michigan, where he started the Center for Ultrafast Optical Sciences, and they built a petawatt class laser there called Hercules. But Europe and Asia in particular um, expanded pretty rapidly, and we grew a little bit. Um, this is data from the International Committee on Ultra-High Intensity Lasers that keeps track of this stuff. Um, as I mentioned before, multi-petawatt lasers now represent the scientific frontier. And you'll see that, again, there's um, a predominance in Europe and Asia. Um, there's some projects in gray here that I 
they're in the design or the construction phase, or even kind of the twinkle in people's eyes phase like Excel's in Russia. And I don't think that's been going anywhere for a while. Um, we want to get EP Opal on that map and and uh, um, get back into this and actually lead the lead lead the field again. Um, so, of the two bits that I want to talk about, the multi petawatt prioritization. There's a, a little grab of the the, the front cover of it. Um, this was a um, effort led that I led with Louise Willingdale from Michigan and Antonino Di Piazza, who at the time was at the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics in um, in Germany. Um, and now I'm proud to say that he's a, a faculty member in physics here because he saw the all the interesting stuff we're planning on doing. And there's our, our lovely faces. Um, so the workshop, and you might say, okay, this isn't science, but we you've got to organize science to get anywhere, I think, significant. And this this is a uh, an area that requires planning and thinking thinking across not just individual groups or even institutions, but multi-institution and multinational. So we assembled four working groups um, with lead, uh, co-leaders in each one of them in high field physics and quantum electrodynamics. You'll see these act, um, abbreviations going forward. Particle acceleration, advanced light sources, lab um, astrophysics and planetary physics and laser driven nuclear physics. And those seem like areas ripe for um, leveraging the, these high energy short pulse lasers. The high field physics, I mean, they're almost self-descriptive. I guess the one thing I will point out, and you'll see this in, in just a bit, particle acceleration and advanced light sources actually underpin quite a bit of the, the science in the other three groups. So um, keep that in mind. Um, it was an interesting time to run an international workshop. We started in 2021 in the, in the midst of a pandemic and ran everything um, by Zoom. It, it worked well. We were drawing people in from the US and Europe. We had some participation from Asia, but that's particularly difficult when uh, that's so many time zones. But we, 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 we did get some Asians because they were, they were keen to be part of it. But we started with some preparatory, just trying to set the table, if you will. And we had virtual working group meetings. This is very uh, a cartoon, a bunch of virtual working groups that each of those groups individually held. And members, we had, I think it was 250 registered members of the MP3 workshop. And people had multiple interests. So we, we staggered them so that um, people could, you know, for instance, people involved with PALS who were also interested in, this is an old figure that had 1P before we added the planetary. Um, uh, they could they they could and they did participate in multiple different working groups. So we ran, ran, ran through till the summer. We had a couple of cross um, um, fertilization meetings. I forget what, what I actually call them. We ultimate, ult, ultimately ended up with one all hands Zoom, um, broke into um, um, a subset of, uh, of, of finalized the workshop. Then we held the workshop in April of, of uh, 2022 in, in Paris, and it was it was great. It it had a, about 50 50 in person, 50 50 breakdown of in person and Zoom participation, but it was very um, interactive. It was great. Um, it built on you know this didn't didn't just pop out of nowhere. Um, <clears throat> this workshop built on community inputs and recent reports <clears throat> that had already started to identify the highest priority multi petawatt science. So at the top of this, you'll you'll, you'll see our you know, the cover of our workshop. But there were a bunch of other uh, National Academies of Sciences study report, uh, the Brightest Light Initiative that um, we ran here in the U.S. Plasma Science, uh, just lots of reports. And I think historically, the United States has had good efforts organizing things, put them into workshop reports or whatever, put them on the shelf, and sometimes they get lost. So the idea was to pick up. All these, um, all this material, and do something with it. And by the way, it's available on archive. Uh, if you just type in MP3 workshop, you'll find it pretty easily. But um, I'll walk you through the different science areas, and it's very top level. But particle acceleration, which is the first part of PALS, um, really includes <clears throat> electrons and an ion acceleration. Uh, the top plot here shows um, some curves, if you will, for conventional accelerator technology, and if you can't read it, but that, you know, once you start getting up into the TEV range, you're talking about multi-kilometer accelerators, um, which gets very, very expensive. This number here is old, 
the proposed International Linear Collider um, many years ago was estimated to be about 6.7. I think it broke into the next digit pretty easily. And it's not clear it's going to get built because it's so massive. Um, laser weight field acceleration, and I'm not an expert at this, but it's, it's depicted here where you can use a plasma and create a plasma bubble that drags along behind the laser pulse and can collect electrons and accelerate them um, to high energies has a um, not quite as steep a curve, but it starts at a much smaller scale because you can start with millimeter or centimeter scales and start getting out to multi centimeters and even out to the meter scale and start approaching um, pretty high levels, pre pretty high energies for the electrons. But that sort of runs out of steam as well because there's a dephasing that occurs between you know, the light pulse and, and, and the electrons. Um, some of our scientists over at LLE came up with this dephasingless laser wake field acceleration concept, AKA um, flying focus, where you can control the speed of the light that is driving the bubble, um, <clears throat> steeping it back up. And now, you know, if everything goes well with EP Opal, and it never goes completely well, right? And we all know how projects go, but with the 500 joules and um, 15 femtoseconds, 20 femtoseconds, um, we'd be getting up to about a TEV in one stage, which is a big deal. Um, Laser-driven ion acceleration uses other techniques that are um, in, in developed and actually theorized, but the, 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 the machines don't exist yet um, to get um, ions into the 100 MeV and even the GeV range. Well, I mentioned uh, with particles, you can start producing <clears throat> light sources. I, I list two here. Um, Betatron and Compton, but there's others that you can produce with uh, electron sources and also directly out of uh, uh, laser pulses, short laser pulses. And you put those two together and you can start doing some interesting high field physics and QED experiments um, shown here with this. This is the ultimate with two laser beams colliding into each other and producing a electron positron plasma mixing in with the pho um, with photons, which is affectionately called a, pl uh, a plasma fireball. Um, keep going um, with the ions in particular, but also gammas that can be produced out of the advanced light sources portion of PALS. You can start doing some interesting um, nuclear physics. I show here, actually I'll, I'll get into it later, but um, ways to start um, understanding the uh, production of heavy elements. You can also do gamma ray spectroscopy with the gammas that come out of the, uh, the laser. And last but not least, lab astro and planetary physics. Um, with Omega EP, we've got these, this nice, in this case, uh, I'll say planar hammer. You can produce high density and temp um, temperature conditions, characteristic of high energy density science, and then start probing them with um, the short pulse lasers or even boosting the pressure with uh, um, um, uh, shocks that can be produced with the short laser pulses. Um, so basically, they mid-scale research infrastructure, or we call it, NSF calls it the RI1 pro, um, program. We have a design project to try to um, build, you know, design a facility that could be built to access all these areas of science. All right, uh, and I'll just touch on each one of them. So we went through um, the workshop process, identified science themes, and came up with a couple of, I'll say, juicy questions with each of those themes. And they, and they tend to parallel, in some sense, um, three of those four science um, areas. Highest energy phenomena in the universe, that's sort of the high field physics and QED, but there's certainly interchange between them. And there's a couple of, of um, science questions that popped out there. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on those in the next slides. Um, <clears throat> the uh, second science theme, the origin and nature of space, time, and matter in the universe, a very kind of lofty and sexy sounding, cap capturing those questions. And I'd say last but not least, the nuclear astrophysics and age and course of the universe, um, ways we they can be um, studying nuclear physics processes and understand, um, well, I'll get to that. And last but not least, under, underlying all of those, um, the particle acceleration and high energy photon sources that I mentioned, the PALS working group focused on, there'll be a lot of um, basic um, R&D in order to, um, push those uh, particle energies and photons into the higher energies uh, that are useful for those areas. Um, we also spent a little bit of time um, talking about strategies for creating the, uh, the diagnostics that a facility, um, a multi-petawatt laser facility would use, and, and, and I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit more. And we spent a little bit of time dreaming about what's 
you know, next? What would an optimal next generation facility look like to go after these grand challenges? Because you know, as soon as you build the biggest facility, there'll be new science questions that go beyond that. Um, all right, particle acceleration and high, high energy photon sources. I mentioned electron beams. That um, Here we've got the laser wake field acceleration. There are a, a number of different electron acceleration mechanisms that intense lasers can produce, including direct laser acceleration. Same with posit positrons. Once you can um, produce the electrons, you can actually um, then pick them up. Uh, electrons and positrons in a positron uh, plasma, you can actually pick up the positrons and try to accelerate them as well. And of course, ion and neutron beams, they typically start with ions um, that are actually, uh, in most cases, um, accelerated by the, the electrons that get out front and then drag them behind them. Um, once you've got ions flying at high energies in a certain direction, you can typically run them into a into a target that then will um, spallation target that will produce neutrons that are also of great interest. Um, I mentioned earlier, this is just a, a, a cartoon. The, the different photon sources that are possible once you have lasers and electrons, uh, high energy betatrons, they, they actually uh, come out when you're doing the laser wave field acceleration as the electron oscillates back and forth in the bubble that actually produces a, uh, a nice broadband source of X-rays. Uh, another approach is to um, scatter a laser beam off an electron beam that's Compton scattering, and you can get into the very high energies, uh, gamma rays even. Um, and with the flying focus scheme, um, theory shows that we can improve um, the collimation and the and the monochromaticity of 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 the of the gammas coming out of there, pretty typical source that we use regularly at LE and other laser facilities is to just um, hit a high Z um, foil, a, a metal, um, and it produces Brumstrahlung X-rays that are used for backlighting um, experiments. Um, on the other kind of the other extreme electrons. Um, Exiting a material into a new, a new material can produce um, <clears throat> optical transition radiation, um, that, or, or even terahertz radiation at the at the longer wavelengths. And not, but not least, there's a kind of a holy grail. If you've got electrons and you wiggle them in a predetermined uh, magnetic field, whether they're um, conventional magnets or even a laser focus, you can actually produce X-ray free electron lasers. Um, due to the undulation. Uh, high energy, this is getting farther and farther from my expertise, but I'll say uh, it's pretty interesting stuff conceptually. You know, cosmic rays are the highest energy uh, particles or phenomena in, in, in the universe. And we can start understanding or trying to understand the source of those cosmic X-rays um, experimentally, not just me measuring the X-ray, uh, excuse me, the, the uh, um, cosmic rays, and and um, trying to figure out theoretically where they came from. We saw a recent article where some, um, well, we all know about the um, about the God particle, the Higgs particle, but now they call it the Oh my God particle. There was a um, super high energy, I forget how many GeV um, cosmic ray coming in. They backtracked it to an empty part of the universe. Where did that come from? Um, uh, we may be able to help sort this out experimentally. And then I mentioned this earlier, the idea of how light transforms into plasma fireballs. Um, and again, the, not my expertise, maybe Dustin back there can explain it or, or Antonino, he's, he, he's in Germany right now. Um, give him a call when he gets back, he'll have office hours. <laughs> um, origin and nature, space, time and matter in the universe. I said that was kind of a sexy lofty way of describing it. You know, in one area we, we already do work with dynamic compression is, you know, how, how do complex material properties and quantum phenomena emerge when you start pressing things together at atomic pressures and temperatures relevant to planetary cores? We're lucky enough to also have a, um, a, an NSF Physics Frontier Center here called the Center for Mater Matter at, at, um, Atomic Pressures, um, led by Rip Collins and um, a number of other PIs. And all the interesting things that happen with fairly regular materials, once you start squeezing them hard, interesting interesting things happen. Um, how can uh, multi-petawatt lasers study black hole thermodynamics through the link between gravity and acceleration? 
this is one of the flagships. It's not going to happen for a while, but the idea that you can create acceleration um, um, situations similar to falling into a black hole um, and the relationship, the, the, the theoretical relationship between unruh radiation and Hawking radiation might be explored. Uh, and I'll say last but not least, how does the electromagnetic interaction behave under extreme conditions? Um, lots of theory as you go up into in higher and higher quantum parameters and um, you know, getting to the point where you've got uh, individual processes, pair cascades, and then uh, radiation corrections, maybe what we think we understand. Uh, the third big science area, and I'm just gonna touch on one of the two questions, what can be learned about heavy element formation using laser-driven nuclear nucleosynthesis in plasma conditions far from equilibrium? Um, you can see here in, in the astrophysics a bunch of different conditions where um, fusion occurs, um, higher and higher um, atomic number and, and weight um, uh, material is produced. You get up to the, the supernova area, and you get all the elements with Z greater than 28. Um, some of this work gets done at uh, conventional accelerators, but they, it has a problem that they don't include the hot plasma backgrounds. And using a laser-based system um, looks like it could access some of these areas. And in particular, um, there's something called the R process. Didn't know about this until the M MP3 workshop and some of, some of the uh, LDNP folks explained it to me. I'm like, well, that's kind of cool. Um, there's a whole section up here, if you can see it, the R process is not very well understood once you get up to very, very high, uh, heavy elements. Um, and, uh, you know, they basically proceed at high temperatures, gigakelvin, so it's super hot and I think pretty good, and very high neutron fluxes where um, the neutrons are being absorbed so fast that you start climbing the uh, uh, chart of the nuclides, if you will, before these excited states have a chance to to decay. Um, and if you can produce those kind of um, really like almost solid density neutron pulses with temperatures associated with the, uh, the new neutrons coming in at high energy, you can start exploring this R process. Well, I mentioned earlier that ions are needed to produce the neutrons. Well, while you're at it, you can also start taking a look at, um, um, oops, looking at the, uh, the P process, which is proton driven um, nucleosynthesis, which is the other side of, the, of, of that, that, that curve. All right, so if, if you aren't completely jazzed, um, you'll see why you should be. <laughs> so OPAL, which I'll, I'll say again, it's an optical parametric amplifier line, um, looks like the way, the best way we think to get to the ultra intense, uh, ultra intensities needed to do this kind of science. And I flash this up, you can get a copy of the slides uh, later, but we've got a QR code here that you can, you can grab and um, like I said, we're looking for inputs. We've got inputs through the MP3 workshop. They tried, tried to get the big picture of the fields to pursue. Now we're gonna drill down in each of these areas in what we call frontier science working groups. And if you wanna join um, them and, and watch what's going on or, or participate in the discussions of how we're going to turn those big science questions into top level um, science requirements that then turn into facility requirements so we can go design something that will meet them. Um, grab the QR code and sign up as a nice registration form online. So this is what we think it's gonna look like. This is what we've um, worked on for a number of years. I'll describe it briefly um, and then show you that there's still some choices to be made. Uh, first, I mentioned starting in 2008, we started working on what we call MTW Opal. And, and that, that's where we've, um, we've demonstrated, and I'll sh show a slide on this, but um, you know, multi-dual uh, 15, 20, right now 20 femtoseconds, we think it will go to shorter than 15 femtoseconds, where we built a you know, broadband front end, you always start with a small pulse, and you just keep amplifying it. And the last stage um, amplification is where we've demonstrated a scalable amplifier that can then go to the next stage, pump with a larger pump lasers, that'll get us up to the 500 joules, um, 20 femtoseconds compressed and delivered to target target areas. Um, that's our baseline. I show you over here the um, the intention that we'll be bringing the beam lines that uh, a part of 
DOE called the National Nuclear Security Administration, our one of our main, our primary funder actually, uh, built and we commissioned them in 2008. That those are the long pulse UV beams that um, can be used for uh, high energy density science. There's a couple options. Um, this is the baseline we're going after. Another approach would, and this was the idea we started with back in 2019, actually, you use EP beam lines to pump those NOPAs. Well, that leaves fewer of them available for experiments. And Omega EP has a relatively uh, slow shot rate. Um, it shoots once every 90 minutes. We'd like to do better. Uh, these pump lasers that we're talking about up here for NOPA 6 and NOPA 5, we'll, we're, we're, we're working on um, technology development to get those to shoot every few minutes. So that'll increase the scientific productivity um, of the facility. Another approach, which is kind of interesting, is to take one of the EP beam lines in its short pulse mode and kind of put it on steroids or jack it up so that it can get shorter pulses with approximately the same energy, and we can go to 10 petawatts with a high energy petawatt um, beam. That means more photons in a longer pulse, so it's lower intensity, but some of the science areas may actually prefer more photons that can produce more ions and more neutrons, for example. Um, like I said, MTW Opal's operating right now, and um, we're looking to add a target area in the not so distant future um, to support uh, science in the area. Um, if and when we get the chance to, to build EP Opal, It'll be a. It'll require a new building, uh, which I show here conceptually added to the existing facility where Omega and Omega EP are built. Um, some other additional lab and office space, and we've just added a new um, office lab expansion, um, the OLE building that um, will be taking taking um, beneficial occupancy early next spring. And there's a picture of it a few weeks ago before they planted the grass and and um, in the in the landscaping. So things are underway, which is great. Um, okay, OPCPA, again, top level. <clears throat> um, I think we uh, many of us probably know about the CPA that was um, developed here in Rochester. You start with a short pulse, you stretch it, so you can amplify it in a bunch of amplifiers without breaking them, and then you compress them in a typically a grading compressor to get the short pulse that you want to focus on the target. That's conventional CPA, and I would say it's pretty much run when it's coarse. I mean, Thai Sapphire has dominated the um, no ultra-fast uh, field for a long time. They've made, they, as they say in, in uh, guess, Oklahoma, they've gone about as far as they can go. Uh, you can't make Thai Sapphire crystal much bigger than, um, than now. So the idea is to use um, to put in your CPA, address here um, in particular, it. There are uh, a my, of non collinear OPA and optical parametric amplifiers where you mix in the nonlinear crystal a pump beam, and I depict it as green because that's the, the color of the light that we'll be using with yeah, the red broadband beam. Send you. And so it amplifies it. You know, essentially, that photon split um, I just, into, an, a, uh, into right. an additional signal and then an idler uh, um, photon that goes off in a different just... direction in this non collinear scheme. I'm really looking um, for your apartment. It's actually, you can so see here, in order to conserve like, energy and then momentum or phase matching, like where uh, the residence. idler ends up pointing in a bunch of different um, directions um, to make up the difference uh, rules in, 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 in the uh, all phase all matching. Or the, so the, I would go with your momentum right. conservation. So the idler is kind of useless. And I like to say the idler takes out the trash. But the beautiful thing is that even if there are wavefront aberrations um, in the pump beam, they only get imprinted on the idler. Um, Whereas the signal just goes through, so the, the quality of yeah. beams in the OPCPA can be extraordinary. We the MTW laser, which has an OPCPA front end, so, um, is basically diffraction limited, which is a testament to how good OPCPA is, and then all the optics that we used downstream. Yes. <clears throat> um, a little note down here: there are some crystals, um, KDP in particular, oh, do graded oh, KDP um, can be grown large enough for these kilojoule class broadband so amplifiers. So they're you know, mirror scale crystals. Um, and the, the DKDP has a kind of magical condition. It's it's not a condition where it can support it like 200 nanometers of balance. Um, so, so that's what that's what we intended to to um, oops exercise. Uh, I mentioned this MTW laser. 
when I was a young buck, we built the multi terawatt oh, laser. It had an OPCPA front end. It's pretty hard. To glass like amplification. We compressed it with a uh, pretty traditional uh, grading compressor and went to a, a target chamber. We've adapted it in, in a mode. It can run either that, that picosecond more mode or a nanosecond narrow band mode. Um, and it pumps a, a final stage of this OPA, uh, OPCPA, of the op this is an optical parametric amplifier line. And um, so an all OPCPA system has very good optical quality. I'd say the only thing that gets difficult is when you've got that much color. Uh, many people here know about having to achromatize optics in order to get, um, you know, say, good pictures or good imaging with broadband light. Um, it's a problem both to get a good tight focus, but also to keep the colors together in not just space, but in time so that it comes to a focus at the same point in time and space. So we've actually developed some interesting optics um, uh, to, to deal with uh, re refractive optics that actually introduce radio group delay, which essentially bends the uh, the, <laughs> the laser pulse in, in space um, and in time to the point where you can't focus it. Um, and then we've also developed achromatic image relaying, all reflective image relaying um, that we'll be exercising in EPO pulse. So we got our first shot at that here. Um, and uh, we are already doing experiments in a under dense plasma chamber. And I don't show it here, but I'm kind of pointing the other direction. We'll be adding another target area to do um, some interesting science. And that's what it looks like um, from a CAD footprint standpoint. You know, this is the original MTW laser system. We added the extra target chamber for the under dense plasma experiments. Um, we built um, a tabletop petawatt class. So the, the, the TQ, the tabletop terawatt that, that, that um, Gerard built, is just across in a in a laboratory that has been reconfigured, but is just across the way from from this. So I like to think of the MTW Opal as being part of the heritage of that um, CPA developed here um, in Rochester. Uh, just a quick show of uh, we like to demonstrate things before we go and spend lots of money uh, building a big version. So the MTW had both light for short pulses and then a first focus campaigns. Um, we didn't get to the half petawatt or the 500 terawatts because uh, we're, we were waiting for a crystal to get grown with the proper deuteration level, which we now have. Um, but we, we, we basically exercised um, all the muscles required to, um, um, to make an, op an opal system work. Um, and, you know, gone through some struggles and, 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 and worked most, almost all of them out. Um, as I mentioned here, um, the Strel ratio is 0.7. Some of you say, why isn't 1.0? Well, that's tough to do. Um, there's actually conventional optics we, we, we put in the system um, based on a deformable mirror that we have that will um, work on the linear um, aberrations of, of a pretty complicated system. We expect to get up pretty close to one, which is good. Um, in fact, it's, it did so well that it, it scored a, a, a cover article in the High Power Laser uh, Science and Engineering Journal uh, a couple of years ago. Um, ongoing improvements, no lasers done. Um, we're making mostly improvements to the back end, uh, which is with the short pulse and energy. Like I said, uh, we've got this new NOPA 5 crystal after some tra travails. Um, and we have plans to implement a double plasma mirrors to improve temporal contrast, which is uh, shown in this frame here, when you've got super intense laser pulses, you don't want the experiment to start before the main pulse arrives. Um, and that's an area of um, active ac active research because when you're up at 10 to the 23, 10 to the 24, and and um, and experiments, plasmas form at 10 to the 12 um, in, uh, watts per centimeter squared, you've got 12 orders of magnitude of dynamic range you've got to uh, keep under control. And right now, some early experiments, we've got 10 to the 10, um, but that's uh, defined by the noise floor, actually, of, of, the, uh, um, of the diagnostic. Um, so in some cases, the experiments will actually tell you whether you've got the, the temporal contrast. Um, just a quick view of what it's going to look like down the road as we design out the system. Um, we plan to have two target areas with uh, flexible focusing that can be used for those different science areas that I mentioned and having two target areas, it means you can be setting up in one, shooting in the other and switch back and forth to, 
try to maximize the utility of a facility. That's the way we do a lot of experiments here in um, at LOE. It will be a little bit different though, because a lot of the diagnostics, for instance, are much bigger. We we do a lot of reentrant diagnostics, or little ones that hang off the target chamber, and some of these will will require moving big big systems back and forth. Um, a range of different targets, both solid, liquid, and, and gas. Um, You know, starting with a common front end means you can co-time, and um, and co-timing is important because if you if you're driving electrons with one and photons with the other, or maybe something else going on, you want to know that they show up at the same point at the same time. Um, so starting from the same source is, is beneficial. And long term, the idea is to actually have two beam lines, both of them 25 petawatts, and then coherently combine them so you get effectively 50 petawatts, which is probably the only way to really get to the exawatts range where some um, the craziest science gets done, I would say. Um, that's that's a ways off. Coherently combining 25 petawatt beams means you need, you need, you need to produce them first and, and that'll take, take a bit of time. Um, we got separate amplifiers for two alpha beams, each of those being the 25 petawatt. Uh, shot rates, we, we've expected it, it, it at the slowest five minutes per shot, um, we'd like to get down to a few, few. And then, like I mentioned, we have the nanosecond multi-kilojoule and UV beams coming from Omega EP. Um, there's a beta beam that kind of uh, will be produced uh, and otherwise uh, split into the, the injection pulses for the alpha, alpha amplifiers. And that will um, be a smaller beam. That will come up first, and that will be used in a bunch of experiments. Um, and in either of the two target areas, but I imagine that it'll come up first in target area two where different flexible focusing systems like the flying focus that uh, Dustin's um, division is pioneering to um, do all sorts of interesting things. And last but not least, I mentioned this epsilon beam. We, we're gonna look at it. You know, the baseline is 225 petawatt beams, but um, there may be, may be some arguments scientifically and, and programmatically to go to the higher energy beam. And ultimately, if we go with 225, we'll, we'll try hard to not preclude also having a, an epsilon beam in the future. Okay, you don't need to read all this, but we have a plan. Um, no plan survives first contact with the enemy, but uh, I don't remember who said that, Sun Tzu or uh, uh, somebody, I'm looking at Chris, uh, the director, he probably knows. Hmm? Could be, I all I know is the quote, it's true, but we have a plan. And if you don't have a plan, you're you're doomed. Um, we, we have a pretty good idea. We've broken down the project into different uh, work breakdown structures that tackle different parts of the problem. Um, we also have the prototyping, both the, uh, the, the um, higher shot rate amplifiers. We have to make some two meter gratings, diffraction gratings that are about, about my arm span and then very large crystals. We Those crystals can be made, but we, we need to characterize them and understand them them extremely well. And last but not least, there'll be a building in, involved. Um, just to give you a feeling for how this will proceed, um, things like this don't happen instantaneously. We'll be going through a couple of steps for requirements, head to a conceptual design, um, get ready to pre pre basically prepare a proposal for, the, for, for constructing the whole thing, even before we've completed the PDR, the pre preliminary design, which is pretty complete. Um, ultimately, it will head to a final design once we get into a construction project. Uh, the PDR basically it defines what you're gonna build and the FDR is where you get all the details together and you can start ordering equipment and and, and, and whatnot. Um, ultimately install, it takes a couple of years to install, integrate and commission. <clears throat> and then we start user experiments. And some of you will be well into your career as students and some of us will maybe be past our career <laughs> when it happens. but. This is what happens with big science. It takes some time to get, get the big tools in, in, in place. People are involved and we have a great team right now. I'm the PI, so-called PI, or, and also the project director. We got co-PIs who are specialists in each of those areas um, from a number of different institutions. Uh, we've paired them off with people at LLE and the University of Rochester to work with them to work um, to, to work through the requirements and ultimately monitor how the project design proceeds to make sure they meet those requirements. 
Um, I should update this. Liz is no longer prospective project manager. She is the project manager. Um, Dustin um, is kind of overseeing, I'll say the science. Jake Bromage, another Institute of Optics alum, um, is leading lasers and Brian's here too, um, working closely with, with uh, Jake and a bunch of other people. Experimental systems, Steve Lancy's not here, but I think, and we, this list doesn't include Mike, we've actually split um, experimental systems and diagnostics into two separate WWS elements. So we've got a solid team uh, for design. Rip Collins, I mentioned, he's the, the director of that CMAP, um, Physics Frontier Center. Ming Shang leads our users program and Terry Kessler leads our DEI efforts at LOE. We've included um, both for design and some of the prototyping efforts, sub awards to four different um, institutions, three universities and a company that really is the leader in, in diffraction gratings. Um, Igor de, de designed the shielding for a, uh, the other NSF multi-petawatt laser I showed on that map. Uh, it's called Zeus, tortured acronym. I won't say what it stands for, but it's, uh, it's great. You know, Zeus, great name for, uh, for a laser. He designed the radiation shielding and why not exercise his expertise and as they bring their systems up, they'll be measuring how well the, the radiation shielding work. So we're involving involving Igor as an along front, old time friend. He actually started doing OPCPA at Livermore before we did. Um, and he went, went, went a different direction in the, in the nuclear physics. Liquid crystal devices, we have a very active liquid crystal program here. Doug, Doug Schumacher at Ohio State University has been doing some really clever stuff. He takes liquid crystals, smears them across an aperture, kind of like a soap bubble, um, and can produce very thin um, layers, liquid layers that hold together. <clears throat> that can be used for uh, as plasma mirrors, but uh, very thin targets are also useful for um, ion acceleration. And he's dying to work with our liquid crystal experts at LLE and on campus in the chemical engineering department um, to improve uh, those devices that are being used, now starting to get used worldwide at laser facilities. <clears throat> Wendell Hills out front and measuring the highest intensities and we're jump, you know, having him jump on board to um, get his expertise. And I mentioned Plymouth Grading Labs. Um, Teron was a former student and then professor here and he found his fortune in, in business and then um, sold that business and then became president of Plymouth Grading Lab um, with the founder. Uh, Doug Smith, who started at LLE, he started the optical manufacturing shop at in the Institute of Optics, and then moved to LLE. So Rochester is kind of the center of a lot of a lot of things. Last but not least, since this is a big effort, and we want to um, input, we're we're in the process of putting together an external advisory board who will keep, hopefully keep us from running aground in the in, the, in this process. So just I, I think this is close to the last um, last slide. I'm just, I want to sh sh uh, give you an example of where things are. Um, a little black box plotted on pulse energy versus pulse duration, which ultimately gives you a a um, contour of uh, equal peak powers or under certain focusing conditions intensities. Everything's down around here, and the Schwinger field, which is where you know the the fields where the intensity is high enough so you can actually break the vacuum, looks kind of far away. Um, if you want to produce one of these plasma fireballs, you need some tricks and you need some, you know, I'll say, bigger lasers. NSF Zeus, um, they have one laser that they'll split into two beams, one of which will produce, um, and it's relatively conservative, a one GeV electron beam, and then they would scatter a two and a half, what's left over, that would be done with a half, about a half a petawatt. Um, the three petawatt laser would have a two and a half petawatt arm scatter off of that and it would it would just start tickling um the schwinger fields um they're going to run out of steam on this side but they may be able to get the the uh, the electron energies up and in the rest frame of the electrons um the schwinger fields would be achieved you can see where this is going ep opal blows it off the screen um with with the 225 petawatt beams um we're pretty conservative we we I mean, I think we can do 10 GeV falling out of bed. Is that fair? I mean, people are doing that with half half petawatt beams. So I think that's pretty reasonable. 
Antonino uh, did these calculations, and it, it it's actually just off the chart. And I don't mean the figure; I mean it's actually off the off the screen. Um, we will be deep in, in 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 this in this space. Having margin is always good. Um, so I, I leave you with that. And these are the main points of my talk. I won't go through them because it's a lot, a lot more words. <laughs> so thanks. All right, you're in charge. You, you get to ask the question. Okay. All right. Hey, go ahead. Um, so, in, in order to realize the potential, you basically had to figure out all the good uses for this high intensity stock. You know, but one of the things that I wonder is the support facilities required to do the physics under these different regimes are huge. So, I'm thinking just the detector bay in the uh, particle accelerators are even bigger than like I know. most of the you know, yeah. LLE. So how do you resolve the incompatibilities of the support facilities necessary to do the diagnostics that are obtainable by these teams? Yeah, I mean, Jim's bringing up an interesting point. You know, you I've never been to LHC, but you see, I mean, some of these detectors are gigantic. I mean, there's the size of whole buildings. Uh, the the detectors, and I'm, now the names of them are escaping at the moment, um, are hundreds of millions of dollars, and they're gigantic, and they have... It's mostly, I think, to trace um, kind of in four pi what comes out of a, uh, comes, comes out of a uh, collider, a uh, large hadron collider. They're slime and hadrons into each other and see what happens. Um, <clears throat> with laser accelerated stuff, okay, so some, of, some of the collider type geometries will have four pi-ishness to them. A lot of ours are gonna be pretty linear, I would say. But um, that is probably my biggest, I don't say nightmare, what keeps me up at night is how do we put this in an envelope that makes sense and someone's gonna pay for um, to fit. and so we're not going to do everything. Uh, things like that, we'll probably push into, okay, we can't do that at a facility like this. Or if we do, we'll try to, um, sorry, um, design the facility in a way to not preclude future expansions to do that. Um, that's going to be tricky. Um, I would say of, of, of the science areas, let me zoom back, um, of, of the science areas, I'm, I'll try to predict, which is always dangerous business, right? Because someone's going to remind you um, you're wrong um, uh, let's start I'll say the more uh, the, the simpler stuff lab astrophysics and planetary physics we do that kind of stuff in Omega we do it in Omega EP we, we understand that one pretty well I don't think that's going to be too difficult it gets a little trickier when you're talking about really dense materials and you start doing like diffraction experiments you got to have enough space to get the diffraction um, uh, measured I'm not too worried about that one. Uh, Laser-driven nuclear physics, that's kind of new for us. Um, uh, that's one of these more linear type things where if you're slamming um, ions in the, in the spallation targets to produce lots of neutrons and then have them hit something and start climbing that, that uh, chart of the nuclides, um, it's pretty well defined. It's, forward, it's a forward-directed um, type of experiment. Um, the idea of producing gammas that can be used to do spectro nuclear spectroscopy, same sort of story. Um, um, these are all going to be fairly, I'll say, relatively linear particles. You know, the, the PALs work to underpin um, a bunch of these other sciences. And it's going to be sort of linear. The high field physics, that one could be kind of four pi. <laughs> uh, and we'll have to sort that out. So it's part of the process. And, and the good news is, and also the bad news, we're not the only ones doing this. There's a, there, you know, the um, European Union years ago took a play out of our playbook in the United States. They went and Gerard actually pushed it when he moved back to, to France. The uh, European Union started the extreme light infrastructure, three different facilities, and um, one in Hungary, one in the Czech Republic, and one in, in Romania. Romania is a nuclear physics facility, and they're a little. They're out front right now. They have two operating ten petawatt lasers, um, and 
honestly, we'll, I think it's one of the more interesting parts of my job, at least, is interacting with people around the world and how they solve the problems. And we can help, you know, we can send scientists to go do experiments there and learn how to do things at the 10 petawatt level and go, go to the next next level. So there's going to be a lot of learning involved. Any other questions here? Let me ask the people on the Zoom if there's any question there. Any questions from the people on Zoom? You can just ask the question or type on the chat something. Um, you can take anything at this point. Actually, I have one other follow-up. How close are you to blowing up the components? How close are we to blowing up components? Uh, we intend not to. Uh, um, and that's one of the, you know, the ideas of going to bigger beams to get more energy through an aperture at a safe level. That won't, that doesn't mean that we won't break a couple of things. Uh, that happens. I time. guess the, the question is, is how much margin do you have based on current fabrication? Oh, we, we try to go for a, approximately a, a factor of two so that we're reasonably safe. So for we everything for yeah. replacing these optics. So for everything planned, you have the processes necessary. Well, for instance, um, um, you know, Tron get down to this picture with you know, just his face, but um, Plymouth Grading Lab, you know, two meter gratings are actually bigger than what we think we need for. It'd be two meters, and, and diffracting gratings typically, and when they're operating, it's sort of a two to one aspect ratio. If we get to two meter gratings, that's actually bigger than is needed by our estimation to do one uh, 25 petawatts. So like, uh, I like to build in margin whenever possible because that means if if things go as well as you thought, maybe we do more. <laughs> We're going to sneak up on it. You know, we, uh, the National Ignition Facility is an amazing facility. They operate past the red line by design and they have a very expensive optics loop to fix and replace optics in that system. We can't afford to do that, so we won't. I have a question about the pulse width. I mean, you talked about femtosecond pulse width. Is it important for you to have to shoot very short pulse width? I mean, uh, uh, for the different science areas, yes. I mean, what you you know, for instance, in high field physics, you want high intensities in high fields. Um, in some cases, like um, actually lately during nuclear physics, I mentioned this epsilon beam, more photons in a longer pulse because you get more. Uh, I'll say a bigger but longer pulse hammer, if you will. Um, um, some people actually like detuning the, uh, the match between the stretcher and the compressor. You end up with a longer pulse that has a residual chirp because you can do um, more interesting things with it. What about the, uh, the walk-off between the pump and the signal you would amplify? If you don't have any walk-off problems? Sure, there's, there's temporal walk-off and, um, and spatial walk-off in a non-collinear um, ample, uh, OPA, um, if you have tiny little spots, the pump and the signal actually walk off each other and the, and the, and the, the process is over. Um, the bigger the beam, the smaller fraction of uh, the spatial walk off. Um, um, and and the, in the phase matching process, the temporal walk off is, is essentially it's minimized. But it's still a limiting factor, right? Uh, you try to minimize it and, 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 so far, it's it's not so much of a problem. You've got nanosecond pulses also, by the way. You're not trying to overlap peak with, uh, you know, femtosecond pulses in a, in a crystal. You've got a chirp pulse that's overlapping with a nanosecond pulse. Well, yeah, so that's almost like you see that we got the yeah. right. Okay, any other questions? No, let's thank again, once again, John. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. And you're all welcome to come out. Just uh, give us a heads up and we'll be through. Well, background.